the time. Like you need to know science, you need to know math, you need, you know, all of those, but use your interest to get better and better and better at it. And the, and the value part is, uh, as they get older, we want them to make money off of it. So it could be just $1 if you need to, yep. because one of the keys to this is that, so it'd be like, if you have a kid who's really into music, my recommendation is um, they need to, as soon as possible, find a way to bring value to the people around them, right? So grandma doesn't count, mom doesn't count, your recital teacher doesn't count because you're paying them. Would they come and see you unless they were obligated? You're talking about music. Like yeah, music, music, right? So if the answer is no, that means you have not figured out how to bring value to people because as soon as you wrestle with that question, you can find the answer. It may take some wrestling, but you have a chance now. So what happens is a lot of people have to use to pick on music as an example they'll quit after high school and it's because there's no venue so they become baristas that they can't debt they can't continue because they didn't uh, find a way to pivot during their teen years with their music to bring value to people hello and welcome to the disrupt the everyday podcast we're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life we discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship we also engage in some difficult but important conversations and now here are your hosts brian and tanya hamilton welcome to another episode of Today we've got some disruptors on, Jonathan and Renee Harris. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. Hi, it's good to be on. Actually, you're the first people that we've interviewed with that are also a couple at the same time uh, while we're being interviewed. This is pretty cool. Oh, there you go. <laughs> all right, awesome. All right, we're breaking all kinds of ground here. All right. Well, uh, let's start off by getting to know you a bit. Who are Jonathan and Renee Harris? Well, I guess we're disruptors. <laughs> I like that. We have uh, we have nine kids. We live in Northern California. Um, I would usually people ask, did you plan that out as far as having a large family? And it's funny because I remember when we were first married, four was a lot to me, like four kids <laughs> as you guys have. I, that was like the largest family I knew they had four kids. So, but you know, you just start having them and then we just kept having more. And um, so by the time we did what we're doing now, that in itself is a story, but it started out as a um, just kind of doing our own thing. I was staying home with the kids. Jonathan had a tech business that he worked for. He worked for a tech company. And uh, I started making some skincare products at home. And then we were also homeschooling. So there's an opportunity to sell what we were making at a local farmer's market. So I thought that'd be kind of a fun homeschool thing to do too. And our oldest were uh, 10 and 12 at the time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that turned into eventually a family business and through a series of events that became our family business. But then we also noticed that we have a lot more freedom as entrepreneurs to raise our kids differently than the norm. And not just that we homeschooled, but there's a lot more that we could bring them into the business, but not just that either is that we started to capitalize on their um, talents and interests and develop those. So along the way, and that was 10 years ago. Yeah. At least 10 years ago. No more than that. I think it's been 12 years now, but uh, we have, raised each of our kids, we have five now that are out of the house and four still at home, um, to be not just entrepreneurial, but to develop those skills and talents. And that's how come we we created the website, Parent Their Passion, because we were blown away at the opportunities and the, the things that kids can do. Um, we're always, you know, people put them in sports or music or other activities, but if you really make a little bit more effort into identifying some of those skills and talents, you can actually develop that into something that they can bring long-term to the world really. So make it more yeah. of a marketplace thing. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I kind of want to circle back to early on, you know, you said in the beginning, four kids seem like a lot mm -hmm. to you, obviously you end up having nine. What would you say to, to someone, because I hear this kind of rhetoric a lot. Oh, it's, it's too expensive to have more than X number of kids. <laughs> what would you say to that? Well, the, the, the truth is, is that in, like in most situations in life, like well, if you were to meet an employer, right, your, your, your favorite boss, and um, it's difficult managing just one coworker, right? Because you spend a lot of time trying to manage and communicate. So you extrapolate from there and you think, okay, so my boss who manages 10 people, he must be 10 times as exhausted as me. But you actually know for a fact that maybe your favorite boss is actually pretty chill and relaxed. It's because he's managing uh, the one or two people that you're doing very differently when he's managing 10 people. 
And, and so there's economies of scale, if you want to use a fancy word. But the truth is, is that you get better as a parent. Uh, hopefully you do. You get better <laughs> as a parent. You figure it out. The kids start playing with each other. That's a big factor that mm -hmm. people who have just a few kids don't understand. The irony is, I think when we had just a few kids, it was harder for us to get to church than we when we had more kids. It is counterintuitive because we would show up. Uh, we're probably slacking. We're not as as um, regimented as we were when, like, when you had tons of kids in the home. But <laughs> we would arrive on time and before everybody else, simply because if everybody eats quote eats breakfast, for example, any time they want, it's sheer chaos. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, when we have one or two kids, when we had, you're not really worried at what time you're eating, what you're doing. You're just kind of very laid back. But when you start having lots of people, you have to figure out, put older kids in charge of younger ones. Okay, you dress, you get their shoes on. And so it becomes a lot more, just like a really good boss, um, you can become a little more chill about it and you delegate. Yeah, it's okay, a big you delegation. Del a lot of delegation, right? Exactly. And mm -hmm. as the kids get older, the bonding starts. So as opposed mm -hmm. to people living individual lives, you know, there's just a lot of natural. We're definitely seeing the fruit and the ease of it now. But mm -hmm. there was a time when, when we had we had twins as well. So we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and then twins. That to me was the busiest time ever. Uh, it's yeah. harder, it's harder when you have fewer. <laughs> that was that was but I also learned right away that I would be sitting on the couch with the twins and I have to get up to get them and back then we didn't have cell phones. I had to, you know, oh, I needed <laughs> <laughs> so I would assign my four-year-old to go get me a glass of water because I would finally get settled with the twins and all of a sudden, oh, I'm so thirsty. I'm like, oh, but then you kids can get water. Kids can mm -hmm. empty the dishwasher. There's just a lot of things that a little bit out of necessity, but then you realize you can really, which is, I think, why it turned into the way we raised them with raising, having their own passions and interests, because we also had to look at, well, are we going to put nine kids through college? That's going to be really expensive. That would be expensive. So then we have to get resourceful and creative. And that's exactly what we did. So the kids that are out of the house have never come back to ask for money. They left pretty much in their 17. They're on good terms. Not because they're men. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing well. <laughs> but they want, they were like, they were ready to launch. They wanted to, to get out in the world, do their thing. And they're all doing well. They're all they, without even college. None of them decided to go to college. So they've all launched and uh, either created their own business, started their own business or used everything that they learned um, to get as a portfolio to get the job that they wanted after they left the home. So it just, it just takes more creativity sometimes. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Cause I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm big on that delegation too. Right. And especially I'm home. I will be work both work from home, but I'm available during the day and like I've been off for the summer and stuff. And you never want the kids to take advantage of that, especially at, coming from mom, like, oh, well, you're here, you can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I made it very clear when I gave up working outside of the home, you No, know, everybody's helping, <laughs> you know, and everybody can pitch in and you can help with your baby brother, this, that, and the next thing. And it's true what you say, right? It does eventually become easier now that they're older. I no longer have to go behind them after they've done a job because for the most part, they do the job well. And it's like, it's like a benefit, right? And uh, the other point I like that, and we're going to get into more is the post-secondary education because a lot of people nowadays, you know, they've done that university. Like I went to university, I did college. Um, and you sometimes don't even end up doing what it is you went to school for or getting that job. And I just like to see that there's so many other options out there for kids who are finishing high school. And it's no longer one of those, you know, you're looked down upon if you don't go to university. Right. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to chatting more about that. Yeah. To, to your point, either you, you don't end up in the field that you studied for or you end up with like six figure student loan debt for a job that pays you yeah. like 40 to $50,000 a year. Yeah. Or the other one is we we're just talking to, we were at the gym today and, and uh, uh, a fellow that we talked to a lot was complaining that um, his daughter just finished law school with an expensive degree and then decided she didn't actually like law. She knew she'd be miserable. So she then, oh. <laughs> so <laughs> like, oh, my goodness, he loves his daughter. But, uh, and so, and I, and I think this is part of the larger, uh, package of what's going on in our culture mm -hmm. that uh, and it's totally normal um, as, as kids as young adults you get enamored by tv and of course you know that's why people go into law 
you're, you're watching the shows, right? But I, when I was, I was going to college at one point back in those days, I was like, I want to become a lawyer. And there was an older gentleman who was sort of a friend of the family. And he says, well, before you make a decision, <laughs> why don't I tell you a little bit more about how the actual law works as far as day to day. And it changed my mind. Mm. And, and I think that there's a lot of uh, buyer beware in, in the university system right now. A lot of things exist for their own sake. And so mm -hmm. I think the disconnect between education and the real world is, real world is growing. So that's part mm -hmm. of the anxiety that people are feeling, you know, so, so with young people and adults, everybody feels anxious because there's no longer a clear line between, okay, you graduate from high school, you get into this school and then you project and you're going to be doing this and this, it's not there anymore. It really is not. And it's, and I, all around me, all the young people, um, they're in, they're in that zone, especially if they're going to college, there's just a lot of anxiety going on. Mm -hmm. All right. So just looking at that, um, obviously you took the education of your children into your own hands. So can we talk about that? What, what prompted the decision to start homeschooling your kids? Yeah, I think again, we weren't, I don't know that we really made the decision when we got married. It was um, a few years later, our kids, our two older kids were pretty young still. And we went to a forum of homeschool parents and there were four different, very different families. They were very different from each other, but they were talking and introducing people to homeschooling and talking about it. And this would have been back in night. Well, early 2000, well, maybe 2003 Barely. or so. Yeah. And so it was, we didn't really know a whole lot about homeschooling, but we were totally open to it. So we went there and then we realized that there are a couple of things that they all had. Well, first differently, they were, one would be like a trucker husband and his, and then, you know, a family. So he's gone all the time. So they just rearranged their schedule so that when he's home, no one's doing so. He, so he could be home for three days and then on, you know, on the road for four days. But when he's home, it was just be with dad. We're doing dad okay. stuff. You know, he might take over some of the things, maybe if he's interested, and doing some of the homeschooling he could it was a perfect schedule for them and then the rest of the time it was homeschooling so they rearranged their schedule do you remember some some yeah other? a couple of, one of them was like a university professor maybe both of them were university professors one of them was a public school teacher another one might have been a doctor um, so the family's life looked very different very very mm -hmm. different and then the other part that we really did like liked a lot was they all said the one thing they all had in common was they said that their kids got along really well. So yeah, I should remember too. One of them was a bullying situation. So okay. yeah, people have different reasons. Some some felt like their kids weren't being academically challenged enough. Yep. Another might have been not so much for academics, but their kid was having a serious bullying issue, so they want to pull them out. Mm -hmm. So they had really really different reasons but and and all of these people were christian so they were very concerned about the ethical and spiritual side of it that was one aspect of it mm -hmm. but what we walked away we talked about this after every single one of them said that the side benefit of doing doing that uh taking schooling in their own hands was that they bonded with the kids a lot more and that the kids bonded between them other. yeah they said that and a lot some of them grew up in really good homes some not they said they were astonished that children could love and like each other that yeah, much. Like each other all day long. yeah and they said <laughs> yeah. that was not that's not the reason why they went into it but every single one of them no matter crazy. what yeah the background and then the other one for me as a dad that resonated one of the dads said he was sick and tired of not being seen as a, an intellectual force and the teacher was <laughs> so now he liked having conversations with you know just current affairs or whatever so it wasn't just entertainment so you come home and you're only entertaining them with you know, a fun vacation or, or trying to talk about what happened at school that day yeah. and the kids are kind of yeah. checked out and you're yeah. tired and you, you just don't have those things in common. Whereas when you're, it's not like you're with your kids 24 seven. I mean, it's a lot more, especially at the, now that our kids are even older, it's checking in with mom and dad, or we're checking in with the kids more coaching. And then at lunchtime, mm -hmm. which is our main meal, we're talking about the things that they learned that day. So they've done their thing and then we're all discussing it at the table. So you get to be a lot more engaged in the conversations with the kids too. Yeah. It's interesting because in the city that we live in, um, the uh, homeschooling community is actually quite large and uh, they have, I don't know if in your city they have this, but um, the kids, like if they want to sign up for plays for extracurricular activities and all that kind of stuff, you can sign them up. So they, you know, a lot of people will say, well, are they going to get that 
social interaction, right? And uh, it's really neat to see that they're really not missing out on anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So Lots I see the benefits. Yeah, yeah, I see the benefits there for sure. Yeah, the, the opportunities have exploded out there and they just keep growing exponentially. So um, we don't hear that. I think when we first started homeschooling, we would hear stuff from people saying, are they being socialized enough or not? That, that conversation has <laughs> completely died. I think the homeschoolers won that war completely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> entirely and forever. So, um, and, and but in addition to the whole question, uh, Tanya, were you talking about like post high school, secondary education and all that, what's happening is that partly with a combination of the internet and the super tutors and the super teachers, they're seeping down and through your door into, I mean, I'm talking about the positive stuff. I know it's negative stuff, but the positive stuff is that once you get exposed to these amazing teachers on any subject you can think of, and uh, and then you compare that to what you could get in high school or even in university, nice professors, but half the time they're talking to the board and I'm trying to play around with the tapes and then say, like, ah, oh, forget it. I'll just read the textbook. You know, now you can go home and you can get amazing uh whether formal teachers or whether they're just more like uh you know somebody who's obsessed about an aspect of science they're so much better mm -hmm. and you can replay them over and over now that's a different story than the social part the socialization part but from the pure academic perspective i mean your kid can i mean now even mit has uh which we don't use but mit has all their science courses that all these people online for free unrestrained wow. they won't give you the degree because they want the they want the cash <laughs> but if you just want the content it's available and That's and it's i mean it's just like a flood so as far as like gaining the raw knowledge that you need it is available and it's becoming better and better by the day mm. awesome and then the other piece of that too well the one thing that you mentioned is like you know lunch is your main meal by lunch they've already done their thing that's the other thing i found talking to homeschooling parents is that it takes a lot less time to, yeah. to get through school. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there's a lot of overhead in the more traditional route where there's a lot of coming and going and finding papers. I mean, there still is at home too, but yeah, not compared <laughs> to the... Minus 30 extra students in the room, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just out of curiosity, did any of your kids ever say or request that they wanted to check out a regular yeah, school? Yeah, through their stages of that. It depends on, I remember when it was uh, our young, our oldest were young, they just wanted to go on a school bus. They were just yeah. done. Like, how do I want to get on a school bus? They really could care. They didn't really know what was going, you know, what happens inside the walls or how school was unless they, they probably saw Clifford whatever shows or something. <laughs> They, they really wanted the school bus experience. So I took them on a city bus, which I know is not the same thing, but I remember taking them on the bus thinking, okay, I'll get this out of their system. And, and it got out of their system. Okay. I mean, it probably didn't really, mostly because it's all adults and then they'd have some people talking to them. You know, they didn't know who these people were and they didn't want that. So okay, we're done. But yeah, so at the end, they have school friends that go to school. So they have- um, Well, there was one, one instance, uh, it hasn't really been a problem because we do have these ongoing discussions because our, it's not, we don't, our conversation, our ongoing conversation with our, our teens is not college, no college. It's actually, will going to college accelerate you to your goals? Okay. And every one single one of them knew enough because they were deep enough in their marketable talent that they're saying no. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they're saying it'll probably hold me back. So the only time I would say, and uh, my young adult probably won't admit to it, but I could tell one time he's one of them. Um, I'm not sure who it is. And I won't say his name, but <laughs> I, I think I, I do remember though, you can, you can have an awfully good time in college racking up debt because you're always available to party. So <laughs> I knew uh, that there'll be some friends who probably think, Hey, you schmuck, why are you uh, working so hard at developing your career and talent? when you could just come with us and have a party every day. Uh, but then the tears come later after college. So I think there was a little bit of uh, um, wrestling uh, psychologically in his mind. It's like, why am I having to, you know, put in the hours developing their, their talent, their real talent. Uh, while these kids always seem to be available, they call them up. Hey, you want to go to the movies? Hey, you want, you know, they're always available. Um, 
And so there is a little bit of that social pressure, but that was just for one. And and now, as soon as those kids finish college, I think everybody realized oh, they chose. The and business. you really have to, you know, we just put our kids in situations, social situations yeah. of of kids that are, you know, you could you could put your kids in any kind of social situation. If you're going to put them uh, with other kids that are just going to cuss all the time or just waste their time or, you know, want to skip school, your kid's going to be pressured by that. So yeah. don't put them in that situation, put them, try to, as much as you can, you know, navigate their friendships or put them in better situations and then they'll rise to the occasion. Yeah. It really has not been a problem. Yeah. And and that's simply because you have a real alternative. So, and I, and I think sometimes parents, you know, if they think like, oh, I really, uh, yeah, maybe college is not the best, but then high school comes, they finish. And in our area, uh, you know, People will panic. Either they join the military or they'll sign up and and get lots of debt because it's they don't have any plan at all. It wasn't their plan in the first place. And uh, then you hear you're I mean, hear this just heard it recently. Someone of the kids been gone four or five years in the military and they're sick of it, you know, because they signed up. They seduce them with like you know a sign on bonus and they get to have the motorcycle look great, but then they're gone uh, for years on end. And some of the other ones are involved in college degrees that they don't even know why they're doing it. So, mm -hmm. but if they have a passion and and it's marketable and they groom that, it's it, be, it becomes a question, well, okay, well, if I go to college, will it get me there faster or it'll slow me down? If the answer is yes, then go to college. If it's no, then keep pursuing your marketable talent. Right. And I think just being able to look outside the box, like there's probably so many people listening because as you said, like society just tells us that after high school, it's either apprenticeship, college, university, you know, probably have um, people listening who, you know, have all these funds into, well, in Ontario and Canada, it's registered education savings plan, you know, all that kind of stuff. But to stand back and look at, you know what, there are different options. I, I like to just learn, right? Even if that's not what happens with our kids, but for yours and the ones that have uh, been there, how did, I guess, how did they go about it after high school? Please share. Yeah. Well, that's where it, and this is where we figured it out when, when we were running our own business with zero experience. That's not what we went to college. We were for, very so. much employee minded. Very employee minded. That. And, you know, I had a, uh, a teaching credential and and I taught high school and 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 then you had an economics degree and then he was in the tech field so to completely like walk away from that and start a business making lotion and selling it online you know that's just already that's already weird and then we have a big family and then we have and you know, we're homeschooling them so what happened though is when our it kind of triggered this is that when our oldest was around the age of 12 maybe 11 12 that's about right we were starting to think about like and I think it was mostly Jonathan was thinking through, wait a minute, we don't have, we have all this freedom to do things uh, any way we wanted to. So that's when he decided like, let's start to identify those um, talents and skill sets and interests that he has. And then I don't even think we were thinking this much at the time, but to develop that long-term so that he has something by the end, uh, by the time he's 18. That he could actually make yeah. it. Well, there was a trigger moment, actually. If you people like sometimes like that, I mean, our mindset was positive. We were thinking we can do things better. So we were extremely hopeful. Sometimes when we see the old pictures, we're like, oh my goodness, we look young and hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> it's code for naive, you know. But so you try things. And there was a moment when um, uh, I was working from home for the, the, the tech company and I knew the layoffs were coming. So, you know, it's that atmosphere and th it was the end of the market, but we would go to the library a lot and we figured out as good homeschoolers that if each kid gets one card, then they could get 12 or 20. So you come home with like a boatload of books, you know, and, uh, and then you'd, you'd, um, uh, you'd lose a couple of them. That's part of the cost and you pay for that. Okay. It's all part of the game. Uh, and so when we actually moved to uh, an area of Northern California that's semi-rural, so outside of the big city, we used to be in a big city and was like, oh my goodness, we're not gonna have access to books anymore, which isn't true. <laughs> I told my son, hey, he was about 12. It's like, oh, you gotta read the Sherlock Holmes book. I'm gonna go get a coffee in the other room. What? Because we had the habit of reserving online the books and then go pick them up where mom would pick them up. And so I said, go ahead and reserve them. He hadn't read any of them. I just remember from my youth, I love those. So. I go to the other room, come back with my cup of coffee, and my son says, okay, I got them. It's like, great, mom will pick them up next time. He says, no, dad, you don't understand. I have them all, 
right here. And I think it was just the beginning of the tablet and Kindle revolution at that point in time. Okay. So I knew you could download PDFs, so I wasn't unaware of that. But I didn't realize how easy it was to get the books. And I think by the end of the week, two weeks tops, you had read all the Sherlock Holmes books. Well, you covered yeah, them because you had on Kindle. Mm -hmm. And to, and for me, it was the realization that this is a significant shift. Um, one of them is I had flashbacks of bad memories of college doing English classes, which felt like a repeat from college, but with a bunch of other uh, troubled people. And all I'm trying to do is I hated the material. So I had to write my essays in a way where I wouldn't get a bad grade, but I despised everything we were reading about it. So <laughs> like, this is crazy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just in this um, um, sort of this, I'm just taking the, taking the test, getting the grades. And, and I thought, well, all we're going to do at this speed is we're going to accelerate our son's uh, education. So now he's doing college level type of material. And I'm like, I don't really want my kid reading the stuff oh, yeah. that's not really appropriate until you're much older. It's too much to handle. It's like, why are we doing this? I mean, okay, we're filling the buckets of knowledge but it's not getting me where I really want. What is it I want? So that's what we said. What is it we want for our kids? We said, okay, what we really want is for our kids when they leave home that they have enough of a passion for what they really want to do in life that they can support themselves with it. So going back to this, our oldest, he had an interest in photography. So he had a camera that one of my relatives gave him. It was a pretty nice camera. It was hand me down, yeah. But he was getting better and better at photography. And so we had this product-based business. This is fast forward past, lay, there was a layoff. And then we decided, let's just go all in on this, on the home business. And then we threw ourselves into that. So we're, you know, we're a little bit of a stressed out uh, couple here <laughs> trying to figure out, can we make this happen? And um, trying to launch a business at the same time after a layoff and so on. So the kids had to be patient with us and just said, you know, we're doing our homeschooling, but you guys also, if we call you in to do help us with something, you need to do it. And so with our oldest, we thought, hey, he's getting good at photography, he's spending all his time on it. Why not have him do our product shots and actually take the pictures of our products for us? So to do that, because um, we couldn't pay a photographer, this is just, we're just bootstrapping the whole thing. And so uh, he would go, we had him go to the camera shop and ask some questions. And when the guy found out what he needed from the, there were lights, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there was some special lighting that we needed. He said, he gave him like a little lesson, you know, he's a 13 year old kid or whatever. And he gave him a lesson on how to take pictures of products. So he got this little lesson. He came back home and at the time, you know, we couldn't just pay him cash, but we needed to incentivize him somehow to do the work for us. So we would just give him like free time on the computer or, you know, a bag of Doritos or whatever we could do to just like, here, do this for us and we'll reward you. And then, and then it just got better and better and better. We just realized, wow, he's into it. He sees that he's bringing us value, which is fast forward to now. That's what we teach parents is like, when you're, when you're starting to identify those talents and interests in your kids, you need to figure out right away, how can they bring value to the mm -hmm. family? or others, but something that's going to bring value as soon as possible, as soon as possible, because they're consuming their kids are it, used to, yep. you know, it simplifies everything. Yep. So if your kids have a million interests and you want to know what's worth pursuing for the long term, look at the one. Now we're assuming these are all genuine interests, right? That you don't have a problem with yep. them in themselves. So let's say they're all genuine. Then you look at the one where you say, what can we bring value this weekend to someone else? So with this son, that was the start. It was like this photography. He also enjoyed doing videos of the neighbor kids blowing stuff up or whatever. And they would just do these big, long um, dramas and so on. So he, he had some interest in videography. And then you know, a few months later, a friend gives him a drone. So those were becoming a big thing back then. Hand me down again. Hand me down, yeah. <laughs> but he could detach his camera to it and do some, you know, some drone photography. And then later on, this is, you know, a few months later, then he's um, getting actually a little gig from a local real estate office because they need some drone photography for their rent. This is a rental okay. place so for their home. So it was like all these things were little stepping stones. And then after that, he decided, I really like the drone part. And he's still in the videography. So he would put together whole, um, it, it developed probably within two or three years, where then he was doing these short commercials. He did one for a, a roofing company using his drone, and he did a whole commercial for this roofing company. And then it just keep, it kept going. It was new. It's, now it seems very popular, but at that time, he was the only kid doing that. People didn't yeah. know how old he was, so they'd look at the internet and say, oh, I need someone to come out, and they just show up like, 
15 year old. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then the part where the parents come in is we are not the professional. We, we don't know anything about photography, mm -hmm. but we're the coaches. Now we're like, if you have an opportunity, kids, once they get really into the stuff that they're interested in, they know where the gurus are. They know what they need to take to get better. They know where the, they should be studying. And we're there to say, okay, we don't really want you to go down that road because that guy's inappropriate. He's going to take you down you know? yeah. or whatever. This is like, it's under our roof. So this is a chance for the kids to kind of experiment and we're coaching and guiding. So from all of that, now he has not only his own drone business, but, and he did that right off the bat to be able to move out on his own, but he manages, uh, he's, he's hired as a contractor to manage a lot of drone operators and so he will have like a team of 15 or 20 people. He's trained them. Now he doesn't have to be the one on the field if he doesn't want to be. And, and then he's taking all the data and then giving that back to these other companies that hire him. And so he, and he got to go all over the U S doing this and he's, he's picking and choosing what he wants to do. And so he's, he was very different. We didn't have a bunch of drone operators out of this. He was the only <laughs> one that went down that road. Our second son was a um, bladesmith started really interested in bladesmithing. He got onto Instagram. He learned how to make his own blades. He spent a lot of time doing that. And we would give him the time. Like, you need to know science. You need to know math. You need, you know, all of those. But use your interest to get better and better and better at it. And the, and the value part is, uh, as they get older, we want them to make money off of it. So it could be just $1 if you need to. Yep. Because one of the keys to this is that, so it'd be like, if you have a kid who's really into music, my recommendation is um, they need to, as soon as possible, find a way to bring value to the people around them, right? So grandma doesn't count, mom doesn't count, your recital teacher doesn't count because you're paying them. Would they come and see you unless they were obligated? You're talking about music. Like yeah, music, music, right? So if their answer is no, that means you have not figured out how to bring value to people because as soon as you wrestle with that question, you can find the answer. It may take some wrestling, but you have a chance now. So what happens is a lot of people to use to pick on music as an example, they'll quit after high school and it's because there's no venue so they become baristas that they can't debt they can't continue because they didn't uh, find a way to pivot during their teen years with their music to bring value to people and it is 100 percent possible to do disabilities with the internet mm -hmm. than just becoming you know a pianist for a, a wedding or something or just right or becoming professional i mean there's so many different things you can do, but uh, that we never had when we were kids. So it's mm -hmm. it's like a whole opportunity. And then, so that was one that we had a one of our sons became a um, a software coder. So he's he's running his own company and he does a lot of coding. And then he has a twin sister who is an artist, total opposites. Those two are complete opposites. She <laughs> yeah, yep. she's she's great with art. And so all along the way, everybody is kind of doing their thing. But we gave them the the freedom and the time, but then we're also there just to kind of give a little bit of the guidance. But really, it solves the the lack of motivation problem. You know, the kids that are just mm -hmm. like not motivated, or their self esteem is low. They can't like I'm not good at anything. You just give them a little room to start to investigate and get better and better at it to the point where you're asking them like if our coder guy i'm always saying hey can you fix this thing on my website i can't figure it out but when you're doing that when they're 13 14 it just starts to grow and blow up it's 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 actually really exciting to see that happen mm -hmm. so so how old would you start would you uh, start investigating what that passion is well we're 13 when they start getting ornery <laughs> and uh, and the reason, and, and I think uh, this is my theory, and I think it's a good theory, is that up until that age, they're very nurture-based. You know, give them mom, gives them a hug. They do a really bad picture, and you put it on. They're just happy you're happy about it. <laughs> but when they get a little bit older, they start doubting your compliments. And what they need is external validation that they matter to the outside world. And the truth is, what a lot of what they're doing has very little value, right? So their suspicions are kind of true. But the beauty of that is that as a coach, you could say, you know what, um, you know, you would, you, you, you know, your kid does a, a art picture. That's for example, maybe your kid's artistic and they want to go to the neighbors and start selling it. And you stop them at the door. It's like, yeah. okay, we don't need pity buys. This is really, really <laughs> bad. So the thing is, is then you can have this conversation with your child. And it's like, you know what, I don't think they really want these kind of pictures, but maybe let's think about what, they might want. Let's have a conversation about what they want. So for in the example of our daughter who was starting to do very realistic art, um, and that's what they would teach you in school typically, it, 
nobody, everyone was saying, oh, this is really nice. But no one was willing to say, hey, here's two bucks or five dollars even for you to do. She's getting zero, nada. And so and part of the reason socially is because the digital cameras are so good that no one wants to pay five thousand dollars for a portrait of their you know, grandma, um, unless you're super wealthy. But what, you know what they did want? They want a cartoonized version of versions. Versions. <laughs> <laughs> We're staying away from that. <laughs> of uh, of their of their grandchildren or their pets. Yes. So they what they wanted is an exaggerated um, uh, capture of the personality. And man, people want that. So stuff. she got good at not just drawing, right. but she would get good at um, showing the personality. If it's a cat, she would go and look because she had an. She also had an Instagram account. So people can see the kind of art she did and then they'd say, oh, can you be one of my cat? So she'd go and check out their cat pictures of, of their pet and notice that the cat's always very, you know, just snuggly, very snuggly or um, maybe playful or whatever the characteristics the cat had. She would bring that out. So that's what people yeah. really wanted. They were, they were asking also for because I could see some of the um, email requests coming to, to my daughter. She would tend not to respond to the ones saying, could you do my grandkids? I'm like, why aren't you doing those? Kids? You're practically throwing money at you. And she says, well, it's because whenever I do kids, they look like old people. And uh, <laughs> they, like yeah, babies ones? look yeah. like old people, mm -hmm. which is a common. So I didn't. So well, why don't we Google that? So we did. There's probably a lesson. Yeah, sure enough, there's a tutorial. And actually, I think it said exactly how to make your baby, how to make your babies not look like old people. So she, so I said, you know, she, she might have been discouraged. It's like, why don't you just take the lesson and then see? She took the lesson and she, the guy explained exactly. It's because, you know, the eyes are, are not the same proportion, the head's not the same proportion. And so now after one lesson going to a super tutor, we talked about this online. We tried a local art school, forget that. So we went to <laughs> online version. You could get very specific to your problem. And boy, then she started accepting all the, the uh, small children, baby versions of it. And that's how you wrestle. That's how your child wrestles with the market. And it's partly a way for them to discover what they want to do, because as they're doing this, some things they discover they really, really do not like doing. And that's OK. They thought they did. Mm -hmm. But then we'll pivot. So don't, we won't abandon everything like we didn't abandon the realistic art, but the same principles held. But we pivoted to more of the um, cartoonized um, uh, version of what people wanted. And that's what people wanted to pay money for. Yeah. Interesting. So, so what, what do you feel is kind of that um, the dynamic that, that happens from age twelve to thirteen? That I'm curious because you were very specific. That thirteen is when you want to start really well, we, covering. Because we experimented. We all good. Make a difference. And uh, we tried. Well, what happens if it's sooner? Like, what happens if it's eleven? So, but what happened was, so we tried that with one of our kids. He would have, if he were in public school, he'd probably be in, you know, in drama because he just loves to perform and act. And so for him, we thought, okay, we'll try it at eleven. And he was interested in voice acting, so uh, we would get him to, yeah, I think he had a book or something, and he had a he had a little um, recorder, so we would allow him to just like listen to commercials and copy them or whatever it was. But it takes so much work on the parents' part to try to find the things that they can do that you wind up doing the you work. Do the, it's a lot uh, more yeah. a science project, yeah. a big science project. Yeah, exactly. Doing. So you don't want that. That's not the point, right? You want something. You're there as a coach, but you want them to do the work. And right. one of the secrets is, I'll think, if I can use you two as an example, is that sure. you have you have your own businesses from home. So if your son, your oldest, is interested in ha somehow helping you in your business, you can decide. Well, I know where I need you is to come over here and do this one project for me. Well, if it's not really something that he is good at or really interested in, there might be an aspect where he really is. Like maybe he is like, he's your extrovert and he wants to get on the phone and schedule, or he wants to call and remind people, okay, well, we're gonna, we have an appointment with you at three o'clock, we'll be there at three, or texting for you. All those little things that is a hassle for you, but you know, you're with a little bit of training, your son can step in and finding those talents that he can actually develop. Or maybe he's like, I love taking things apart. So he's gonna take apart the equipment and clean it for you. And then put it back together because, you know, maybe it's not your favorite thing, but it's his. He enjoys that type of stuff. So that's how we would also look for anything in our business and our family life. It has to matter. So yeah. one of the things you don't want to do is give him fake work, right? right. So a lot of times, um, uh, and you can see this in other parents that do that. And we've probably been guilty oh, once sure. or twice, but we're <laughs> a lot more aware. Or you're giving him busy work, mm -hmm. they will catch on to that and they will resent that. 
So it has to be something that makes a difference. It doesn't have to make a huge difference, but it has to be a, a real difference. So an example of, let's say your kid is much more mechanical and he wants to help you in the business. And um, and yeah, it would be nice if you cleaned the equipment and repaired it. But if he found out that you um, never use the they never use the equipment, they would start resenting that. Yeah. So right. it has to be something genuine. And we have a 14 year old who likes to put like little video clips together. And so for us, it was great to have take some videos that we've done and we have different like courses that we need to put things together, but to take the, we tell them exactly what minute from this minute to this minute and make a clip out of it that we can use as an Instagram reel. So now we just have, we have a spreadsheet. We just add in, here's the link this minute to this minute, put this as the text overlay and he loves it. And then if he wants to add music and we approve of it or whatever, or if it's not, it's like, well, no, it doesn't work because it doesn't quite fit our niche. But if you were, you know, you had your own business, it'd be perfect for your little rock and roll niche over here. That would be <laughs> fine. But they learn that, that, okay, I'm still answering to somebody else because I'm still in learning mode, but right. they get to do the thing that they really like and that they're getting better at. Yeah. 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 You really, it's a, it's an organic gradual process and it's amazing because by the time they're 18, they have a very, very good understanding of who they are. And if and people they, notice yeah. and they want to pay them like, Hey, can your son do this for me? Like that's how our daughter got all kinds of little gigs is they see her art because she put it out there on Instagram. It's the other part we say is like, you need to get yourself out there mm -hmm. and she put her stuff out there. And then someone will say, Oh, do you think her daughter can do this for my, my son's wedding or whatever? And then she does. So it's kind of, it's just how they start to grow. Yeah. And I think as kids, right? Like, they have their hands in so many things. They're always trying something new, whether it be at school, you're doing all these different subjects, projects, all that kind of stuff. So that number of age 13, I see, because at that point, I'm, you know, thinking to our son, I know now what he likes, what he's into, you know, his organization and all that kind of stuff, how it's different compared to even two years ago. Right. Yeah. So it definitely Absolutely. makes sense. Yeah. But I, I like, I do in, you know, obviously it's so important for kids to really just be able to try almost everything, right? Like even when it comes to sports and extracurricular, we're at this stage is like, okay, you want to try it? Sure, give it a go. But if you don't like it, you still got to finish that season out or the lessons out or what, what have you. And if you don't want to do it again next year, then we don't do it. We try something else, right? Because to me, I think, you know, the more you can open their environment and their experiences, I think the better. Yeah. And even with sports, you might find that what they like about it is a certain thing that is like really, you know, something unique that they can bring to yeah, the game in the future. Yeah. We have one son and then we won't get into that, but he's now basically doing project management. He's 18, running his own gig. He loves it. <laughs> but if let's say you had a son who was into soccer, I don't know if it's popular in your area, but you know, soccer usually dies after they finish formal schooling. So, but let's say you knew that really he had kind of a knack for organization or communication. That was really his thing. And you're thinking, well, you know, if he goes to college, he'll probably major in this, nothing to do with soccer, right? So in that case, you look at your soccer situation and every club, every organization deals with parents having to communicate coach to coach and vice versa. Don't forget your equipment. Don't forget next week we're going to be here. Everybody forgets everything. So if you were, if he had a sort of that verbal or written communication, then he could hijack his um, his extracurricular activity and start helping the coach out with communication, which a coach would probably say yes. He gets the dates and times right and he says, hey coach, you know what? I can streamline this and I'm gonna put this in some automated version. So every two weeks we're gonna get a reminder. And, uh, and then the coach is like, yeah, well, people need to pay their fees, but they're always late. He starts picking up the phone and calling and reminding. So he starts building his portfolio um, he starts creating spreadsheets. And so you can see from at some point he could pivot out of even the club and start doing it for other people. So he'd be building his portfolio for college if he even wanted to do that. But if he's very diligent, he'd actually start running. You go from clubs to small businesses and then pretty soon soccer or that world sort of disappears and fades into the background. But he's used his environment uh, as a as an opportunity to develop and showcase what he's really good at. So. Um, that's what it happens to one of our kids. It could be if they're interested in like photography or videography. And so, and you know, the coach has to do all these drills and get the kids to do them. And he'd like the kids to do it when they're not 
only on the field, but at home to practice. And so he could put little video clips up on a YouTube channel for the coach of this is how we did the drill. And now you can go practice. Everybody can go watch it and practice. And he's kind of the hero in the coach's eyes. And the kids are seeing him as kind of the expert. At least he's good at the videography part. He could throw music in there. And so he's getting better at that. And then he's actually helping the rest of the team too. Okay. So I have to ask, parenting their passion. Um, what happens, and maybe you haven't experienced this yet, when, you know, you've seen uh, as a parent, you see their your child is you know, starting to maybe go to post-secondary in regards to what it is they want to do for their career or um, maybe not. But what happens if their passion changes? Like, have you had that experience? Because I know for myself, there's so many different things that I've enjoyed doing, right? So yeah. have you had that? And can you speak well, on me, it? I want to jump on that one because we're, we're when you're talking about it like a big change right what we're doing is we're changing all the time mm -hmm. so so we never we you can have dramatic changes but because you're pivoting all the time that's a you know we don't use that word with our kids but that's what we use you know it's a very popular word yeah. so pivoting by definition means you're not abandoning what you've done but you're you're shifting into a different direction so mm -hmm. you're always building but if you're doing this constantly it's never a, it's never a decision um, like, oh, I was once a violin player, player, now I want to become a scuba diver, right? So what you're doing is I was really into uh, playing violin, but as you are playing, interacting, you're slightly changing, you're adding different skill. And so that eventually you're no longer where you were at all because you are discovering and wrestling with uh, what it is you really want. So a lot of times when the big changes happen is because you're burnt out and, and you're doing the same thing. You're not pivoting and changing enough. So mm -hmm. I do think that uh, if you're paying attention, you are on the right track, but maybe soccer has to go. <laughs> right. Or something, or something has to go, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, he's not being challenged. And that's what will often happen when people realize at 50, you know, they've been doing it for two years and then you know what? I don't really care about soccer. And they just mm -hmm. quit. But now they have, if they haven't been developing in that case of the communication kids, he's got nothing. But if he, if he said, I'm going to pivot out and all I'm going to do is I'm not going to do any of the organized sports. I'm just going to do communications for all the sports clubs at school, you know? So you're, you're kind of creating your own mini world out of, yep. out of that original. So you don't lose, uh, you don't lose that critical time, but you're constantly discovering and pivoting. You know, I, I think that's almost the reason why you start younger, because we had one, one of our sons did, he was, I think age 15, 16, he was really into 3d printing and machinery and then i think he was 16 when he got his first outside the home job where he had to go or he got to, he was excited about it to go work for a machinist and so he went and did i don't know how many hours a day probably he wasn't it wasn't quite full time because he also worked for us at home but he would go there and he realized though and this is after i think six months maybe of working for him he enjoyed the work but he didn't like the he enjoyed idea. organizing it. Let's put it. Well, yeah, but he also enjoyed the work. <laughs> but I think what overall though, he wanted a job in the future where he could work from home. He and this one required that he had to go to an office space or at least a warehouse where all these huge machines were. And he worked for somebody else. And he decided after that six months, and that to me was probably the biggest change. Like anybody else, the biggest, he yeah. had the biggest switch. So he went from working in a machine shop and doing all this machinery type work he decided i want to be self-employed and so this is going to sound weird but he's actually called he calls himself like an efficiency expert for small businesses <laughs> completely not he's machinery at all <laughs> but he was also while he was doing that there he was also working for us and he would do a lot of the packaging and shipping and he would just even be in our um office area where we do the shipping from and he said mom this isn't very efficient he was just like it drove him crazy that i would have my little you know stacks and boxes and so on set up and he's like can i just and but he also liked to use his hand and build things and he was one that thought he'd get into construction but he just like, can i just create this for you and so he did this amazing he restructured our entire process so that it was all streamlined he's like mom we can get we can get this done in half the time if you do it this way he's and very confident this was Would the you town to dial it down a bit but he, he was very confident so then he decided, well, I would rather have a job doing this. I could do this all day long. But he switched that from doing the physical type of thing there, too, to software. Well, I should also mention when he was at the machine shop, I think he, he was constantly rearranging the workspace. Too. Yeah. 
and uh, it's not something you normally do. But yeah, but he, just to see, like, like, I could do this all day long if I could get businesses because he sees like sometimes including ours, it could be streamlined and run better if you use certain mm -hmm. software. So then he got really good at a, a type of software that would just um, which helped companies that had like five or six employees all get trained on the software and then the communication was better. Everything was just streamlined. So it it's a weird job title. Like there's no way I would have thought when he's five, oh, you're going to grow up to be this efficiency expert. But that's what he's doing he, now. He was he the kid, he, I have to say with you in respect, he's the kid who's like a little bit bossy as far yeah. as like he thinks, he knows, we're gonna, mom, we're going to move it here. We're going to move it there. And we're going to say, okay, tone it down. Yeah. You know, we're, we're still the boss here. But the point was, is that he, he it bothered him when things weren't organized efficiency. So if you're to come into your office and he might get like, I think I'm going to move the filing cabinet here. I'm going to do it here. You know, it's like you should alphabetize this. Alphabetize of, it whatever. He, he knows that stuff. So he created this yep. career for himself and he's on his own. He was able to move out when he was 17. He is in, he's also very much of a go-getter. So he was already putting himself in masterminds with all these other men that he can talk to and, and ask their opinion. And so he's gotten all these different jobs because that's how he's wired. But that was a big switch from the machine type stuff. But it also showed him where he wanted to be so that by the time he yeah. was 17, he was doing the work that he wanted to do. Yeah, it's exactly it, right? It's like, okay, this is what I had in mind. This is what I thought. And you try it out and it's like, okay, no, but it's better to pivot. It's better to change that up after after the kids have tried it compared to even parents telling them, you know what, I don't think this is for you. Because we know what would happen in that case, right? Most kids are just sort of going to do, oh, well, that's just you guys talking. I'm just going to do it anyways and then yeah. end up not happy, yeah. and, you know, in, in the job that they're doing, right? You're trying to avoid the the, the crisis changes, and mm -hmm. and I'll see this. You know, uh, we have friends who are involved in particular talent, and I'm thinking, oh, I'll keep that to myself. But I'm like, okay, we're going to be heading for an adolescent crisis here because at some point, I can tell this kid is just you know he's going with the pack, but that is not at all you know that's just not a long term option for him. And so what you want to do instead is mm -hmm. like, okay, if you're stuck in the pack and you have to be there, you have no choice, then start hijacking it. So that example of the soccer, if you're like, ah, once I get 18, I'm done with soccer. Uh, I'd rather go jogging while you're there. If you're stuck in it because, because of your circumstances, then, then start seeing how you can take over the communications. Right? So now soccer is just an excuse for you to start actually imposing your vision of the world. And you can create an amazing portfolio that would just knock the socks off of any kind of specialized school that you're going to go to because you'd have years of documentation of, of your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're really building up that portfolio. Mm -hmm. No, it, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you will find, you by the way, if your son, if your son is, is uh, he's young now, but let's say if he's got this kind of energy and, and if it turns out he's the kind of person that, and when he's older, he likes to manage people, which is this, it's not just a skill set. You have to actually enjoy it, mm -hmm. right? Because there are some people who are capable, but you're like, oh, my goodness, you know. Uh, <laughs> but some people are good. Like our oldest uh, turned out to be a kind of person. I, I've met his uh, employee, the people that work for him. They're my age or even like in their four. I'm 55 and some of them are in their 40s. They He just has this. He's only 24 and somehow he has this. Uh, um, I see him in action, like this reassuring presence. He treats them with respect. He's young, but he's also, um, I overheard him one time talking about how he had to fire someone. And I'm like, so I asked him, it's like, does that ever make you uh, nervous? He says, no. And I'm like, I'm just dumbfounded, but that's something <laughs> to grow into. So if your son, let's say, turns out that he's the kind of person that's just really good at managing people, if you, if you don't engage him in the business, you'll never, he'll never find that out. Right. He might wait until uh, he's 18, go into engineering, and then have, when he's done with engineering, it's like, screw the engineering. I want to <laughs> manage people. Mm -hmm. But he would, he, he had he discovered that when he was 16 or 17, and he's just, even as a kid, people, uh, when you're managing people, it could just be you're giving people reminders, working for you, and he will discover that, and you will see it. You will see it. It's like, oh, my goodness, go put him in charge of reminding people. He just has this, this ability, and... Uh, like if you have a home business or it, people have opportunities within their home, even if they're employees where there's stuff they need to get done. And 
give them a chance to use their their bent to develop a talent helping you in their specific niche. So how how early did you get the kids involved with the business? Pretty much, I mean, the 12 year old, I'll have my six year old put stickers on newsletters for me. I mean, it, any little thing that they feel like they're actually useful. And, Wash your hands. Yeah, your just paper, you know, as other times I'll have the same six year old, like if we're doing what we're doing now is podcasts, I'll say, okay, you're in charge of making sure nobody comes in the room because we're doing, <laughs> you know, on the phone. She's the only one I really have to worry about barging in, but so she likes to be bossy too. So any kid that's coming up the stairs and she thinks, oh, she'll stop them. So it's, you, you just, give and by the way, that's an example of real value because if she doesn't stop the little girl, <laughs> we'll talk to her. It's like, you were in charge yeah. of making sure. But if, yeah. you know, if, if you've got entrepreneurs, you I will do little videos. She's like on my little thank you page after people make a purchase in the very last page they get to the thank you page. And she's doing this little dance saying thank you. So uh, we'll just put them in there any way, any way we can, you know, where yeah. they're comfortable too. Yeah. Yeah, we're the same. And I, I think it's important too to realize like they're part of it as well, right? Um, whether you're, you know, you're getting paid dollars or you know you're getting different things we're all helping here and we all have a similar goal and it just gives them for us that opportunity to feel like they're contributing they're adding that value you talk about right and even if you don't have a family business just by helping around the house helping to take care of things that is where that value comes into yes. play mm -hmm. yeah yeah the, the big thing i would say uh, Brian, this is where I, it's, it's fun as a dad because um, you get to be more of the bad guy. <laughs> Your instinct is wanting to say, no, you got to do it better. And especially if you have, have boys, they love that challenge. They don't want to be crushed, but they want to be challenged. And so if they're, especially when they start doing things outside the home with their talents, like bringing value, I will al almost always have that conversation say, you know, the first time we're going to do this, it probably won't work out exactly the way we want. Like it's not at the right time or it's the wrong length. You're not that good. Yeah. And I say, that's okay. So, but that, that uh, problem that we're going to have is going to tell us how, where to pivot. So that's a big thing is like, we always tell them, it's like, um, if we go there and uh, the person wasn't ready, then the answer is then let's get an email going. Let's ask for their email next time so we can remind them or their text. Let's do it better next time. So we always, I always tell them that we're going to bump into a, an obstacle, but then yeah, that's where the answer is going to be because now we know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of preparing your teams for the idea of you're it not could fail, but we don't call it a failure. It's like an obstacle. Failure. It's yeah, it's more like yeah. an obstacle. A failure means you quit and you're done. Whereas an obstacle is like okay, here's quite. And, and we, we discuss it and say, well, what was the problem? So if it was like a failure communication, then we say, okay, the next time around, you need to send them an email or a reminder. Okay. There you go. Well, the last question I have is, I just want to find out, you have the nine kids, you have the family business. Do you, like, how do you make it all work? And did you, do you guys have to cut things out to make it work with the time that you have? I, yeah, I think the biggest is probably have to learn to say no, because you you want to find the, where you can say yes. So okay. for us, it's just, I think we did things very differently. Um, we, we didn't, we couldn't have our kids running around in all these different activities where we're carpooling all the time. That would have just been too much. It didn't work for our family. But we could do the things that were important and uh, different phases of life with our kids, like we just had a 16 year old get his driver's license. So we knew for the past six months, you know, focus is on that kid getting his driver's license, which mm -hmm. by the way, I know you don't have a 16 year old, but life changes for the better <laughs> when they get their license. <laughs> they can do errands for you. We teach them, they know how to shop. They know how, so all of those things, you just see that as, okay, how can it bring value to us? Well, license is huge. I mean, because our other kids were out of the house. We didn't have another driver except the two of us. So now we do. So <laughs> a lot of it is just, managing uh would you just kind of figure out where your priorities are and what the goals are the kids know every day what they're supposed to be doing and getting done and then we check in of course it's still they're still kids we're still parents we have to check in make sure they're on task or whatever yep. everybody gets distracted and then we have to talk about okay that you know your phone with you is a big distraction we take it away just like everybody's normal that way but yep. um so i just a lot of 
managing. And I think I think we're a lot more laid back now than we were probably with the first. Time. Yeah, I think you're <laughs> like you know, and the and by the way, that's part of building the the bonding and the status is like. Um, like I think they did, they actually did do something like sticker making or something for some of our newsletters, I forget what it was. And then they really pushed hard this one afternoon and the kid's like, oh, we just want some ice cream. And, yeah. and so, okay, we'll, we'll get you ice cream. Now, normally a couple months ago, it would be either her or me running down to the store and getting some ice cream. Now it's like, hey, send me in. He's our 16 year old. Time to go to the store. And he starts, he's so happy to go. And uh, and he brings back the ice cream. Of course, he brings back a snack for himself, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but that's that kind of uh, things change. And especially as a, as a team uh, starts taking, their sense of self-esteem and confidence goes way up, sometimes mm -hmm. too far up. Yeah. But that's good. That's a positive problem to have. And you just have to learn how to, how to, how to channel it. Um, and I think we've we've also learned to really question: Is this still a priority? Because prior, yeah. priorities can change. How yeah. you spend your time, activities, holidays. I mean, there's so many different things that we kind of come back mm -hmm. to that a lot. We're like, okay, is this a priority? And sometimes it's like a priority for us is we need to just get out. The two of us need to get mm -hmm. out at night, just have some alone times. So if that becomes a priority, then we know we know that that's happening at five or six o'clock at night. So then we can kind of plan that out and it's also for me it's like priority that okay that the kit the kitchen's cleaned up before we go to bed you know things like that so who's in charge of the kitchen which kid has it that night just those little things that you just put you put in place so that things get done and then yeah and i think you guys are you're probably already feeling that too when you have uh, uh um, responsible enough teen you leave the home you say okay he's in charge yeah you listen to what he says, unless it's immoral or, you know, crazy <laughs> dangerous, even if it's not completely fair, tell me later, but obey him, you yeah. know, or listen to him. Mm -hmm. And we have a little reason. Your kids have told us yeah. that they really appreciate that we look and power when we're gone, you know. We empower the older kids yeah. to be in charge if we're gone. So they get to be in charge. And now, obviously, if they were irresponsible, we'd have a whole conversation about that. But once they are, you know, 16 year olds in charge of everybody else. They don't have to call his mom. He won't let me do this mom. So we're not, we're not getting bothered because if there's a, yeah. we'll be dealing with, with it when we get home and have some conversations, but usually they know that person's in charge. And so, yeah. Yeah. It's part of the whole delegation, empowering your kids. Um, so all you have to do, if you reverse engineer, if you look at where families where it's not working, you can usually spot right away. Oh my goodness. You know, they don't, they don't back up their, the older kids with the younger ones. They don't give them enough responsibility. They wait for mom to do everything, wash their clothes. You know, they don't do any laundry folding of their own. So it's become very entitled mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you engage them gradually, they they get a sense of pride and ownership. You know, they yeah. care about it. You know, they get grossed out by the food left out on the table. Sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Thanks for the insight. You know, the, the last thing I'll ask, because you did mention this a little bit earlier, were the mastermind. So what are some of the, the benefits that you experience being a part of masterminds? And how do you find them? For ourselves or for the kids? Both. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. For, well, um, I've been involved in several different masterminds, sometimes paid, sometimes um, I think for, for me personally, I enjoy when it's a mastermind when we're kind of maybe at the same, more or less the same level of income. I'm talking as a business now, um, mm -hmm. but not everybody is in the same niche. So for me, I might have different uh, people in it that are different skill sets and um, somebody could be just really good at, at coding computer related things, but we're all more or less the same income. We, we can help each other out that way and stretch each other. So I, I enjoy that. I've been in several different types of masterminds. Um, I personally, I think it would be amazing. And I don't, we don't see this enough for kids, for teenagers to have mastermind groups. In fact, our kids tell us, they kind of complain about like, well, the kids, you know, the kids on the street, they just don't think the way I do, or they're just in, you know, they're, they're, they're too different because we're doing things differently. And so we try to find them and put them in situations where they are around kids because our older kids, especially are very driven. So they, they, when they do something, they really want, you know, they have their fun, of course, too, but they want to be able to um, problem solve or just have conversations about what's it like to live on your own and what happens when you have this kind of bill? When do you buy a house? When, so they want other kids that are thinking that way at age 17, and that's hard to find. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for our kids, that's where really it was our, um, when he was 16, but he, that son 
wanted that but couldn't find it and so he got to be part of and it was a paid mastermind and he was the youngest they put him in kind of a 20 something group now he's actually graduated into the older I'm not sure, yeah. not sure why but i think he's in, he wanted more <laughs> so he's into another mastermind with men and well, we've had so an in between where we've actually and we've done this with all the kids we've allowed them to join um, usually some kind of professional group, like a face closed Facebook group, like one in particular, he had to uh, join, you had to actually be a professional mm -hmm. uh, person in that field. And he was the youngest uh, person ever joining. And they didn't at first a little skittish, and they wanted to see his work. So when he, he got in there, so there's a, it's not quite like a mastermind group, but you get a lot of peer feedback, uh, peer, not age wise, but people in the field who are willing to give you because they see you're serious. So that has been helpful. I recommend that. I mean, you have to obviously check the the, the type of form. But. And sometimes to get them in, like I remember one of yeah. our sons who was probably yeah. not even 13, maybe 12, but um, like Jonathan would be the one. Under, yeah. It's under his name. So, so they would right. be under my name. It'd be clear because they don't in. want the legal responsibility. So there's things you can do as parents, like, but in order to join one is they want to see your kid's portfolio. Whether they use that word or not, they want to see evidence because they serious, they, right? They're serious, right? Mm -hmm. So we joke like if you wind up cutting your finger doing your talent by accident, oh, that's great because now it shows you've got grit. Wait, we don't want them to cut their <laughs> finger, but they want to see that these kids are serious and they'll let you join. And usually, if they're very young, like thirteen or fourteen, usually it has to be under my account, and I'll come in and mm -hmm. say my son wants to join, and I'm taking but it's responsibility. Been, it's for one or second born. He was uh, in a bladesmith group, and so some of the guys. Yeah, they're joking around and he he could at the time he's his maturity wasn't quite the same as these 20 and 30 40 year old guys on up and so he learned real quick no that's inappropriate or no you know or he could think it's okay to just snag somebody's design and not give him credit just little things like that that they he'd think oh yeah it doesn't matter if we do it this way and he's and they would be quick to snap on him and say no so it's nice because it takes it doesn't have to be mom and dad saying you really right. shouldn't act like that but some yeah. other older guy that our son has tons yeah, of respect they, for is one. He'll say, you say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, he's only 14 and it's like, oh, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, that's, you know, hard for me to hear as a, as a parent, but I'm just like, no, that's good. He's learned. And so uh, you put him in those situations, mm -hmm. um, you know, with still some, you know, you just want to make sure it's safe, but most adults will treat. They get a lot very of you know, respect. really good attention mm -hmm. from older people because they, a lot of these, I'm thinking guys mostly will see our younger um, sons when they're doing hands-on stuff. It's like, I wish I would have started when I was your age. I would have been so much further. I wish, you know, you, and mm -hmm. our, our bladesmith guy, he, he got all kinds of metal sent to him, wood sent to him for free from these other guys that just scrap pieces that he would have had to pay money for. But so they, they, they treat our kids also with a lot of respect because they've shown that they're working hard at it. Awesome. awesome stuff. Well, we appreciate the conversation. We thank you guys for, for sharing all of this. Now, I'm going to share your website here as well. I'm going to put that up one more time, uh, parenttheirpassion.com. So we have the website. What are the best ways to get a hold of you if we if we want to learn more, uh, if we want to take advantage of some of those business offerings? Uh, share, share whatever you have for us. Yeah, well, first, if you go to parenttheirpassion.com and uh, either there will be a pop-up that shows up or just scroll down a little bit, and there's a place where you can enter your email, and then we give you a whole um, a, a list of ideas, but also it helps you generate those lists of talents and interests. You know, remember, if the end goal is to bring value to other people, we help you kind of hone in on which of those talents are going to be good and uh, how can it bring value to my family? So we have all kinds of tips and tricks. A lot of this has to do with a mindset switch. So a lot of parents, we've all put our kids in activities uh, coming up. And so which ones can actually count for the long term? So that's kind of what we help people with. And by being on our email list, we're talking you through that, those ideas so that your mindset starts to think, oh, is this valuable? Can this, is this something that could be long-term for my son or daughter or not? And even conversations you can have with your kids. So that's the best place to start. Uh, there's the download will take you through all of that. Then if you think, okay, this is exciting. I really want to get my kid on board because we have to convince the kids like this is the way to go. Then we also have a team workshop that's about, takes about an hour. It's, it could be done in the very motivated kid will get through it faster. But um, Jonathan and I take with short clips, it's like a self-discovery workshop. So they can figure out what are those interests that they have. And we take them through a lot of Q&A because a lot of parents don't even realize 
they have so much under their roof that's accessible to these kids and resources and um, an aunt that's really good at a certain type of software that can help. So there's all these different avenues and areas that if by going through the workshop, you find those out. And then we teach how to merge those so that by the time you're done with the workshop, you're able to come up with something hands on that you can actually start right away to work on. Yeah, like within a week or two. So. Yeah. Great. Awesome. And as far as reaching us, Jonathan at parentthirpassion.com or Renee at parentthirpassion.com or go to Instagram. Jonathan's got a lot of a lot of stuff going on on Instagram um, under the Parent Their Passion. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And for everyone who listens to this conversation or watches this conversation, thank you for letting us disrupt your every day. Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.